Thank you everyone for joining. We're really proud to present um, this panel and the subject matter in general. Uh, my name is Dimple Sani, uh, and I'm a managing director of impact investing at Anthos. Anthos is a single family office uh, headquartered in the Netherlands um, for the Brennick Meyer family. And we actually have a family member in the audience who catalyzed, I think, the rest of his family to become more active um, as a cohesive unit. Hello, Stephen. Um, Anthos is a 100-year-old family office. Uh, the Brennick Myers come from the apparel industry. They've had their same company for nearly 200 years, which they still own and operate. It's privately held. So no private investment, no public float. So this is an entrepreneurial family that knows about fashion through decades and indeed through centuries. Um, over the last two centuries, they've of course diversified into real estate and private equity. Um, and they're a a force for a business for good with everything they do, their entire spectrum of capital, but including their corporate, uh, the fashion brand CNA. Um, so I'm gonna just introduce Scott Leonard, who's the moderator uh, for the panel, and he'll introduce the panelists. Um, first, I wanted to say that one of the reasons Scott and I were really pushing for a circular economy is Scott's been in the industry for a long time. He and I both invested in a company in the late 90s called World of Good, uh, if some of you remember Priya Haji. Um, so this is an important subject matter for he and I, and I think for the Brennick Myers, um, they realize that as an apparel company, sometimes there's some of the, you know, these types of companies can actually hurt the environment, um, and so they wanted to do their part in really upending their own industry, which I think takes a lot of courage. Um, circular economy in general is very important because it covers so many different verticals. We're focusing on fashion here today because it's a sector that we all like and know something about. But you'll see that's a really big thread at this conference. So I hope you guys get to learn the broader definition of circular economy, which really cuts across everything from food, waste, materials, et cetera. Um, with that, let me tell you a little bit more about Scott, since um, he and I sort of um, encouraged the conference to have this panel. Um, Scott co-founded um, his own company, Indigenous, an organic fair trade fashion company, nearly two, 20 years ago. Yeah. He's, he's younger than he looks. Um, on the principles of sustainability and, and socially responsible business practices. And for the past decade, this company has really continued to thrive and provide a lot of uh, best practices for ethical brands. Um, he's currently on the board of directors for the Agora Partnerships. Many of you are familiar with that platform. And of course, Fashion for Good, which Isabel will tell you a little bit more about. But indeed, it's an effort that was started by the family that I work for. Um, and he's on the investment committee of CNA Foundation, which again is another family uh, entity of the Brennick Myers. Um, he's an active member of the Confluence Philanthropy, a champion of B Lab as one of the first 15 original B Corps. Yeah. So you were, you were a B Corp before it was cool to be a B Corp. Yeah. Um, and he's been a leader in, in multiple fair trade uh, transparency certification pilots for the industry. So with that, I'll leave it to Scott to delve deeper into some of these dimensions around circular fashion. Thank you so much. Yeah. Hi there, everybody. So nice to have everyone here on a, an important topic. So when we think about all the things that we purchase, uh, objects, if it's the clothing or the cell phones, obviously those leave uh, a footprint, and all too often a pretty nasty one at that. Um, there's no doubt about it that global supply chains are in desperate need of being cleaned up on many levels, such as energy, uh, emissions, land use, water consumption, chemical use, and just in general, uh, a lot of waste. And especially in the fashion industry, there's, there's quite a bit of waste. Uh, the apparel industry is among the worst polluting globally, and I think that that's why this becomes that much more of a pertinent conversation today. Sustainability starts and ends with good design, and that takes the entire life cycle of uh, products into consideration. Great design, involves innovation. And disruptive innovation often means incubation and funding. And that's also what brings us today uh, to, to talking about how we can foster the next generation of truly uh, sustainable design and circular economy. So um, today we'll be talking about a few different, different areas. Um, but I, I cons consider everybody here the vanguard of what we, what we would consider circular fashion. 
So some of the things that are encompassed in circular fashion include establishing within the industry an end of use collection and repair system, breakthroughs in recycling technology, which um, comes to company, brings up companies like uh, that have been at Fashion for Good, um, Evernew, uh, and Agriloop, and Ambercycle, which I hope Carla will go a little bit more deeper into. Redefining chemical use by companies that are out there and organizations like Safer Made and ZDHC. I'm hoping that maybe, Lewis, you can tap into that a little bit. Um, protecting natural resources as well. A lot of people don't realize that Rayon and Viscose um, actually take our most endangered uh, forests globally. And um, so there's a lot of companies out there and organizations that are part of circular, circular movement that are leaving trees in the ground. That's one of the things that we can do that's the best thing when we talk about a circular economy. Let's not be extractive. Let's leave the trees. Let's, let's leave the oil in the ground. So um, what else can I say about the importance of this except for that a circul circular economy needs to happen now and it's not just about us here. It's about our, our grandchildren and our grandchildren's grandchildren. And that these, um, these panelists here are truly on the, on the cutting edge of adopting transformative solutions uh, surrounding all different aspects of, of circular fashion. So uh, with that said, um, I would like to actually introduce, introduce Milos. And Milos, I'm a, I'm a fan of, of Adidas on a lot of different levels, being a partner in and around uh, Fashion for Good, which we'll get to later. Uh, part of uh, the HIG index, which we'll also get to later. But dear to my heart is the work that you're doing right now because you're actually working with entrepreneurs and you're, you're, you're literally taking pilots and funding those pilots and then breathing life into them, which for me is, is amazing. You're giving them an opportunity to have a viable income stream. So uh, without telling, talking too much about it, I, I was hoping maybe you could tell us what you do. Thank you. Is it on? So I, I run a venture practice for the brand here in the U.S. and about half of our work um, is tied to, to circularity. So with that, we look at manufacturing. We also look at you know, various you know recycled content in materials that we want to purchase, and also new materials. And so the way it is, as Scott described, uh, we've our R&D team that's very interested in task to do more. And so we we bring companies, we immediately put them through testing, and for us that takes a little while, but you know the companies are getting revenue, so we want to support them along the way. And then uh, our main task after is once we can really map out how this material can map across various queues, how do we scale it? And at that point, uh, we like to bring a scaling partner for us. Um, I come from clean tech venture. I've seen a lot of companies that have had a lot of investments and I believe that it can scale, that funding will, will solve that, uh, but uh, that didn't happen. So in this case, we want to you know, really apply what I learned before and bring company, chemical companies, engineering companies to co-invest along with us, to really invest in, to buy their, their portion of the risk. Because we don't know how to scale things, they do. But we want to commit to buying material and really take the risk in taking it to the market. And we are very, I'm, you know, really uh, happy to work for a brand that's very serious about circularity, that really wants to do more. It's really never enough. I think there's uh, definitely an, an appetite to do, to take more products to market, to really buy uh, raw resources and materials at even higher prices, so long that we can really represent ourselves out there. Because we, we believe that the campaigns that we create, consumers care about, we provide them with access to a average consumer, we want to provide them with access to circularity as well. And so that's, uh, that's how we think about it. So you're, you're actually um, very much connected to Adidas. It's, it's, um, but what's the, what's the name of the, of the venture? It's Adidas Venture. Yeah. Yeah. Ventures, yeah. yeah. And so maybe, um, you know, I'd, I'd love to hear you talk about maybe a couple of those investments that you've made and some of the engineering pilots that you've, uh, that you've actually participated in. Sure. So the last investment is a company called, that does 3D prints uh, for us in footwear. It's a company called Carbon 3D. Uh, they, we, we wanted to do with them is really uh, take them, you know, build that scale. We wanted to buy into the risk and early on, we believe that we can make a sole of a shoe that can be customized to, you know, how we walk, how we want to run, how we want to really, you know, really, you know, you know, do our activities, you know, in a years from now. And to, to, to the 
point that we want to have a footwear that can allow us to do that. That's, the, that's what we, we were after. And we participated in several rounds of the company. Uh, they raised quite a bit of money. And we've committed a considerable amount of our internal resources, en engineering resources, to really find applications out there. And so now you can buy a shoe. It's very limited edition. Next year, it's going to be more of it. But what's interesting is that will also pro can provide us to access to different markets, such as healthcare, because you can 3D print anything, you know, implement anything in a sole of a shoe. And so to us, that's also very important too. And that's kind of an example of a company where we brought in a pretty significant syndicate of investors. We invested quite a bit of money, and the uh, syndicate was large. And we had actually uh, companies that come from, like, for example, Autodesk was one of the co-investors. And they know the design part of it that we, we don't, especially if we want to you know, go into a scale, to scale the manufacturing. And, uh, and then we have quite a bit of other investors that, are, that I can name right now that come from very strong engineering backgrounds that we learn quite a bit from. And as far as pilots, uh, you know, those, those are not public, so I can't talk about them yet. Uh, but what I can say is that we're looking at uh, polios that don't, don't come from polyurethane, polyur bio-based polios. We, we want to see, we want to test them significantly, because for us it matters how does this product behave a year from now. So we put them through a lab where we really simulate how does this material going to, you know, behave, you know, really behave, you know, after two, year, two years after we actually would have a product. So we kind of we put into rigorous testing until we learn that, and we do the same thing with fabrics. So you actually, so you you're you're testing those yeah. those products. So yeah. you're actually you're you're sort of creating a micro a micro lab, but for yeah. with a retail experience, right? So you're able to to blow on the coals of the innovation, but you're able to put it into the retail setting. Uh, retail also, to, to, so they can learn how consumers will respond. But even more so, we are we are testing physical properties of the material. So we stretch it, we, we try to tear it up, we try to break it, we press it. If it's a, a foam, we try to really simulate, you know, 10,000, you know, presses, which is, you know, equivalent of us walking, you know, over 10,000, 10 miles. And so we want to really learn, really, how does that, how would this product behave? And so we put that through a lab. That's great. So we're gonna, we're gonna get, I want to get back to some of those feedback loops, too, because I think it's so important for the, the innovations. Uh, so, but I'm going to move on to, to Carla. Uh, the first thing that I'll say about Carla, I've, I, I've always been impressed with your work. Um, but you first started in the, in the base of the pyramid, the BOP, uh, actually helping social entrepreneurs, which is also very dear to my heart. Working with indigenous, we, we help artisans uh, scale jobs. Um, I've, you've always struck me as a, as a, as a doer, but that you kind of took entrepreneurial uh, talents to a new level. You broke out. Right? You mean you did something, this is pretty audacious, you, you, you've created your own fund. So um, cheers to you and it's been very successful so far and I'd love you to tell us a little bit about that. Great. Hi everyone, um, my name is Carla Mora and I'm the founder and managing partner of Alante Capital. And Alante Capital is a new impact investment venture capital fund that is investing in new chemistries and technologies to empower circularity within the fashion industry, within the textile industry. Um, so, yeah, as Scott mentioned, I took a, a different path to get to this space, but before moving into impact investing about six years ago, I was working as a development economist in supply chain reform. And that's something that was always very near and dear to my heart. So after learning about impact investing and with my future or my past experience, I really wanted to focus my efforts on a fund that kind of married both of those skill sets and interests and looking at how do we, how can we pull the levers in the way that we actually produce things so that they have a positive impact and not a negative impact on people and the planet. And so that was really um, the beginning kind of seeds going on inside my head that led to Alante Capital. And uh, when I launched Alante, it was originally gonna be looking at uh, the agriculture space and I was doing due diligence on a natural indigo company in the apparel industry and uncovered the incredible environmental problems that were happening in the industry and I was just taken back. I mean, we all knew about the, the labor conditions and the issues in the supply chain. We remember the campaign in the 90s from Nike and you know that part I knew, but I didn't somehow get the scope of the problem, um, the, the environmental problem. But one thing struck me uh, about the apparel industry was looking across different industries that I've worked with in the past, apparel seemed ready for change um, in a really exciting way, that it was coming from the small and emerging ethical fashion brands that were 
driving consumers to start saying we want better products, but also the large and established brands were actively looking at ways to um, improve their production practices, ensure that their suppliers were upholding the standards that they expected, and they were putting resources to work um, with organizations like Fashion for Good that you'll hear about. They, are, they had foundations, um, the CNA Foundation that we heard from Dimple earlier, where they were putting money to actually spur innovation to help improve, to help solve the problems that the apparel industry faced. And that was really exciting, and so I wanted to be a part of it. Um, so anyhow, uh, my fund, I'm the managing partner alongside my other managing partner, Leslie Harwell, who's based in New York, and we recently brought on our third partner and anchor investor, Eileen Fisher, who has her own apparel brand. It's been around for about 35 years, and for the last two decades, she's been completely focused on sourcing responsibly. And Eileen came to us um, to be a part of this fund because as an individual, not from her brand herself, but because she knows the struggles of how hard it is to source responsibly. And it's a big expectation and a big ask that we give to the industry um, to do that when there's not the real capacity to do that across the board. So she understood that it was challenging and she wanted to be a part of making it easier for companies across the entire industry, whether you're outdoor, your luxury, your athleisure, your fashion, whatever. Let's see what is required for the industry to really take steps forward towards true circularity. So she came on board um, and, and we really began about a year and a half ago. So a big part of our model, um, the thing that she was attracted to was that we work with the brands. So we don't look to invest in any brands ourselves. We work with brands like Adidas, um, Patagonia, Nike, Levi's here in San Francisco, The Gap, um, to go in and ask them what can we, what are you looking for to be able to meet your sustainability goals? And how can we help to bring innovation to you that will work within your supply chain? And so we have a very interactive relationship where we work with them to truly understand what are your goals? You want to decrease your carbon emissions by X percent by 2020. How are we going to do that? And there are a lot of strategies. Maybe you source this climate smart cotton, um, or maybe you invest in a new material that is carbon neutral. We, we look across the scope, we can show them, have you seen these different innovations happening in the dye space, uh, in on-demand manufacturing? Have you looked at um, you know, ways that you can better plan your inventory so that we're not overproducing and having to burn unused garments, that we see that in the paper all the time now, and you know, there's, there's huge problems, there's huge problems with waste. Um, and so the brands are very excited to be a part of figuring out ways for them to solve this within their supply chain. So we work really closely with them to understand what the market needs, what's viable, and we source the innovation. So kind of similar to what Milos is doing, um, we're similar to a corporate VC, but we're not tied to a single brand. So we're able to work with lots of brands. And we have, a, because we're a single industry focus, we get a lot of access of ex super exciting innovation across the apparel industry, but we have, um, in order to have the diversification we need for our to be able to have the exits within the time frame of our fund with the, the multiple that we expect, all of that, we're able to um, diversify in a number of different business models. Um, I don't know if they have the slide that, that I put together, but... Um, I was hoping they did. It, and it's okay, <laughs> if not, but it is. Oh, okay, yeah, so um, they asked me to, to show this slide just because it's a, and you don't have to read the small fine print, but it just kind of shows the ecosystem of the apparel industry. And this is the way we break it down um, and where we see opportunities for investment and innovation and how we see it. So one's the production, how are things made, right? So there's the raw materials, like what goes into making the shirt you have? There's the raw materials that go into it, there's the dyes, there's the chemistries to keep it from wrinkling, to keep the dye from running, to keep it from smelling when you're out there exercising, all of that stuff, right? All of those have opportunities for us to invest in preferred chemistries that remove the harsh, toxic elements that end up oftentimes in the rivers and water systems where the products are produced. Um, the raw materials, we're seeing a lot of innovation happening there with, especially right now, we're, we're also looking at the same, com or similar companies that are looking at biodegradable polyester to mm -hmm. address the issues with microfiber pollution that's ending up in our oceans and our fish and our uh, agriculture and our, our tap water. Um, trying to figure out how can we invest in innovation that allows us to have the performance requirement that us as consumers want. We want those yoga pants or our exercise gear to still have that element that synthetic fibers provide, but can it have it without the 
problems that synthetic fibers currently leave in our environment, being that they're plastic-based. So we see these innovation opportunities across the supply chain, looking at processing and finishing to cut and sew and design, something that Scott mentioned earlier is design is an important part. Like these are all elements that go into finally the design that these professionals who really understand customers need to work with. So we have to make sure it works within the concept of is it going to actually wear the way us, us consumers want it to wear. So we look at innovation all the way to cut and sew. Is there a way that we cannot leave scraps on the factory floors? I know um, Adidas has done some cool stuff with fly knit shoes and they're not leaving the waste on the factory floors and there's a lot of innovation that can happen across that. But then once we get out of the supply chain, um, another area is software that we'll talk about. He mentioned the HIG index, but how can we create traceability and, and improve efficiency across our supply chain through better management tools. So these are all options. And then when we dive into distribution, um, this is how we look at it, is how does this really reach the market? You see these retail shops closing down in the malls everywhere, and it seems scary, but really it's just changing. People are still consuming garments in an enormous at an enormous rate, too, too much. <laughs> um, um, and so we look at how are people shopping? Do they need to have ownership over garments or is there a shift towards access with models like Rent the Runway or Black Tux or do we need to own all of these things? What's happening with a resurgent with second hand and companies like The Real Real and Thread Up? Um, so we look at this as an opportunity of innovation of, of how does it reach the market and then once it's reached the market, how is it worn? How is it used? How do we keep it in circulation longer out of, out of our closets but on our bodies and actually in use before going to landfill? Is there a way that we can extend the life of a garment? Um, there are a lot of options here for innovation, uh, whether you're looking at better fit. I'm sure we've all had issues with going in and just nothing really fits right because of the way that the apparel industry has changed manufacturing over time. So looking at new fit technologies so that as a company, you have less returns, which is good for business, that you're actually being able to sell to the consumers what they're looking for. So there's a lot of opportunity and innovation here. And then just so I can go a little faster, the last piece is once it is done being worn, what do we do with it? Mm -hmm. Is it landing in landfill? Is it being burned in incinerators? Is it ending up in our oceans? Like, how do we deal with this waste, especially when so much of it does not break down? Yep. Um, and so what's been so exciting is there's a huge, uh, if you can go to the second slide, that would be great, but um, there's a, a, a lot of innovation happening in chemical recycling. So being able to recycle garments all the way down to essentially the molecular level to separate them out and you have polyester and you have cotton uh, what that's broken down into so that it can be rebuilt and then used right back into the supply chain. So now it's sold to those spinners and yarn makers to be able to make new garments out of old garments. Uh, and that really is what empowers true circularity, though there's a lot of pieces that, that need to happen to make that happen, whether it's the sorting technology, um, all of that. So this is an example of, so those are the innovations. This is what we see as the entire ecosystem, the back end of fashion. And here's just a few examples of the companies that, that are addressing those issues exactly in that way. Um, yeah. I don't know if you want me to speak. To well, we're going to leave that slide up there because it's a great example. It really does show an ecos ecosystem. And although uh, we want to talk about some of these companies, um, We'll, we'll get back to it, um, but you didn't leave a lot on the table. You really covered a lot, so thank you for that. Um, Lewis, we're going to skip you for a second, um, if that's okay. And uh, we're going to move down to, to Isabel. And Isabel, I wanted to say that um, something I've said to you before, too, is that I really do feel like you bridge a lot of worlds. Um, being uh, Growing up in, in, in France, yeah? And, and then um, living in Amsterdam, but also working uh, not only in Amsterdam, but also with a Silicon Valley plug and play. So you're holding up uh, so many different worlds. So when we first were looking at all the different partners that we wanted to bring in for Fashion for Good, which has been an amazing incubation and accelerator, um, plug and play came, came to the top as one of the best and brightest uh, Silicon Valley inc incubators and accelerators. But it's a little bit of a different world, as we've all uh, found out. But you've bridged that gap. And you've done an amazing job. And you've been a huge part of the success. So thank you for that. And part of that success, too, is, is being the bridge uh, between the investment and the investors and putting that innovation into work within the supply chain with all the partners. But it's also understanding the needs of the entrepreneur. So wanted to give you props for that. But uh, can you tell us about Fashion for Good? Your, uh, what, your role with uh, Plug and Play, and um, a little bit about yourself, please. 
Yes, thank you, uh, Scott. Um, so my name is Isabelle Laurence, as you said. I'm French, so sorry for the accent. Um, uh, I'm the director of the Fashion for Good plug and play program. So we're based in Amsterdam and we are part of the Fashion for Good initiative. Um, as you said, it's part of a, it's, it's, it was born as a, a kind of a unique partnership between on the one hand plug and play. Uh, some of you may know because our headquarters are not far from here in Sunnyvale. Um, we are one of the largest corporate innovations platform in the world. Besides our headquarter where we run, run about 14 verticals, um, we run about 30 industry-focused accelerator programs around the world in Europe, um, Middle East, and, and Asia. Um, last year, um, we partnered uh, with Fashion for Good in Amsterdam to uh, launch this program to find, identify, support, accelerate those new technologies and solutions that will contribute in um, transforming that industry into a circular model. Um, so you've covered kind of all the sub areas uh, that we are looking at, uh, and it's very similar to, to what Alan Day um, is doing. I'd like to put some numbers behind the impact that you mentioned, but not everyone is aware of how impactful the textile industry is, but it now accounts for 10% of uh, CO2 emission, which probably ranks very close behind the transportation industry. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and to produce the polyester that goes into our clothing, we use about 70 million barrels of oil every year. Uh, you probably know that for growing cotton, it's a huge amount of pesticides, water, fertilizers. Only 1% of the cotton production in the world is organic. Um, we also uh, look at Fashion for Good at the um, uh, labor conditions and the whole textile industries employ 14 million workers that in some, um, most of the time are still underpaid or under, under the ILO conditions. Um, so all of those uh, are topics that are pressing and most pressing because those impacts, those numbers are expected to increase by 60% by 2025, just tomorrow. Um, so we need disruptive innovation. Mm. Uh, it was based on this statement that, observation that uh, we need disruptive innovation and none of the big brands, big retailer, big uh, industry players can make that transformation on its own. We need collaboration to support those innovations. Um, so Fashion for Good was launched last year uh, in March, uh, the initiative of the, of the CNA Foundation, so the foundation of the big Dutch retailer CNA, um, to bring together all the industry players, uh, the retailers, but also the manufacturers. It's a very large fragmented supply chain that we're talking about. Um, to support uh, this innovation. And um, 18 months uh, after the launch, we now work with great partners, such obviously Adidas, but also CNA, the Caring Group, holding company of Gucci, Yves Saint Laurent, Balenciaga. We work with Target, uh, Zalando, uh, e-commerce platform, PVH, Stella McCartney, uh, and many more. I have now no time to, we have now 10 partners. We'll soon welcome um, a few more. So we're really happy we, to have bring brought together um, industry players that collaborate and openly share because we have built this pre-competitive space where it is on, uh, of the interest of the brands and retailers to de-risk their investment in those innovations by exchanging and sharing their experience with those um, innovators. So in practice, how does it work? Um, similarly to, to Carla Alante, we, we work closely with those um, brands, we, we do not push innovations to, to them because it wouldn't work. We work with them, we ask them what, what are they looking at, um, what are their challenges, and we scout globally uh, the technologies that can address those challenges. Um, we invite them to a program that is based in Amsterdam for three months, and these three months are really dedicated to engaging with our brands, and they meet multiple times, more than five, six times, they get mentoring, they get feedback, they, get, they can, can validate their market um, fit uh, and engage in piloting opportunities with those brands. Um, Is, Isabel, I wanted to ask you how many how many batches have we got now? It's are we up to four? We, we're halfway our fourth batch. So altogether, we've worked um, with uh, about fifty companies yeah. coming from sixteen countries, as, sometimes as far as Australia. Uh, quite a number from uh, North each, America. Each company with a very nice solution around circular. Yeah, and it's, it's extremely diverse. I mean, uh, if you uh, have the slide that uh, Carla put, put up together, I mean, a, a number of those logos uh, are very well known from Fashion for Good. We are or have worked uh, with those uh, companies. It's always a long run. Um, 
So this accelerator program is, is, um, is how we start the engagement with the brands, but Fashion for Goods is much more than the accelerator program. They've put together other programs. Uh, one is the scaling program. So once the piloting um, phase is initiated with the brands, the uh, innovations can be brought to this longer term uh, bespoke support uh, to the piloting phase, really supporting the engagement between brands and, and the startups. Um, we're also raising a fund uh, that hopefully will close uh, very soon uh, that will cover the, what we call the implementation phase. So when the innovation uh, is scaled uh, and tested, approved by a brand, it has to be implemented in the supply chain. As you know, most brands do not own their supply chain, so we need to bring this other player, which is the manufacturer, the die house, the spinner, uh, into the mix in order for them to um, uh, adopt that new technology. And so we have built that fund to support that, um, that, that process and to help those manufacturers to, to, to convert to those new technologies. Um, and lastly, Fashion for Good is also now a museum uh, since we've launched two weeks ago uh, the first technology museum based in Amsterdam in our beautiful Canal House building. Um, so if you're in Amsterdam, you're more than welcome to uh, come and visit. Very interactive, too. It's yeah. very uh, interactive and, and forward-looking, forward so we hope it's... Um, the, I mean, the whole, uh, the whole movement around Fashion for Good is really picking up steam. I mean, the fact that, I mean, it wasn't easy to, to find those first partners, but now, now we have 10 partners. It's amazing. Um, and we'll bounce back, back with some, some more questions on maybe some of those uh, accelerations and incubations. So, but we're going to move to, to Lewis. Uh, so, Lewis, when I think about you, I, I really think of you as an icon around circular, uh, a, as a person, but especially in circular fashion. Um, you, you really have helped so many different companies move towards circular, and specifically in, in the fashion space. If we talk about cradle to cradle certified, fashion positive, material wise initiatives, you've had your hand in all these things. Um, you've really, you've really, um, given yourself to the industry and been on main stage globally, but you're on to something else now. So uh, although, you know, although it would be nice for you to speak about some of those things, uh, we're first gonna hear about uh, what you're doing currently uh, around uh, not only just funding innovations, but really uh, it's, it's, it's the plug-in, right? So I was hoping that you might be able to, to speak to everybody about the HIG Index um, that the Sustainable Apparel, uh, Apparel Coalition uh, has, has put forth and a lot of our brands are using right now and how that is sort of a convergence because a lot of your work right now, at least as I have understood it, is about that convergence. So we can really not have as much redundancy, but we can we blow on the coals of innovation. Have I said too much? No, I think you're right. <laughs> I think this is good. Thank you. Um, thanks, for the, thanks for the generous introduction. I'm going to time myself just because I'm really notorious for going and like 15 minutes ago. And, um, yeah, thank, thanks, Scott. And thanks yeah. to this panel. As I'm sitting here listening to everybody, I'm thinking this is really great because we make up this very interesting ecosystem that as, you know, we're a relatively new organization, the Apparel Impact Institute, and I'll tell you about that in a minute. But as we start looking at what unique role we play within this investment funding and scaling scenario that we're all a part of, um, it's, it's really great that we are here. So thanks for pulling us together too, because yeah. we all know each other, but I think sitting together is important. Um, when I was sitting here thinking a minute ago, I've been in the circular economy work for 11 years, almost exactly. I was hired by Mohawk Industries 11 years ago, and it seems like 20 years ago to me, to uh, come in and help them around the development of the circular systems for carpet, flooring, tile, laminates. You know, these were really products in the built environment, and it re really a origin story for circularity comes out of carpet, interestingly. Yeah. Ray Anderson, Shaw Industries, the work of Bill McDonough, really kind of putting into play this idea of if we could look as an industry at common materials, nylon, nylon 6-6, polypropylene, polyester, you know, it's all the same, and if we design our products in a way that I can take back yours and you can take back theirs, and we can put it into a system, then ultimately, you know, it's keeping that molecules continuously at play concept that we're really aiming for and eliminating the dependency that we have on crude oil and other materials that are deplenishing, you know, that was the system. And so um, I started that job in November of 2007, and on my first day, the CEO walked in and threw a book down on the desk, cradle to cradle, remaking the way we make things, and he said, read this book, you know, and so I did, and, and uh, a year later, I'm hanging out with Bill McDonough and Michael Bromgard, and a year and a half after that, 
I'm at the Cradle to Cradle Products Innovation Institute, and so I've spent the last six years helping build the product standard that um, CNA and G-Star and, and other companies are really working on in terms of verification of um, the chemistry, the water, energy, and of course the material reutilization of the, of the product, the materials, fibers, uh, zippers, buttons, trims, dyes, et cetera, going into the composition. Um, and so, um, so anyway, it's been an honor to do that. And one of the things you mentioned that we yep. launched, which fits very well into these two folks, actually all, all four of us here, uh, is the, um, is the uh, circular innovation working group that we developed over at Cradle to Cradle that was looking at chemical due diligence of the innovations that were going through Fashion for Good with the accelerator that companies, uh, investors like Elante, um, H&M's Global Change Award, you know, all looking at how do we verify that these circular solutions are also having a positive impact from a, from a material health and chemistry standpoint, that we're not creating some unintended consequence that ends up in our water systems or affluent as a result of building something for, for circularity. And so that group's still ongoing and works with a number of the same brands that have been thrown out here. But I think what we're seeing is a trend in, in this collaborative space. And you mentioned the HIG index. So the Apparel Impact Institute, which I'm now running, uh, I'm in day like 45 on the job, uh, was launched this last year with, our origin story comes out of the SAC. The Sustainable Apparel Coalition obviously is the group that created the HIG index and the facility product and brand modules to verify or rate how a company, a mill, uh, a product is in terms of a scale to one to a hundred uh, based on environmental and social metrics and, and heavily on the environmental side. And so the, go the concept of that, many of you in the room may know this very well, but came out of a number of brands like Walmart and Patagonia and, and Nike, you know, who are all working along uh, different audit systems for measurement. And so the baseline was, hey, can we just start coming at the industry meaning the supply chain with a similar set of tools and then we can actually have a common language around what is a 62 versus a 73 and you know what do these scores mean and how we might ultimately drive the whole industry towards impact and um, if you know you know once you measure it once you have transparency and once you start to audit and verify those numbers then you can actually start to say okay this is where we want to go what the SAC wasn't going to do although it's always been sort of in the consideration, is how do we foster and accelerate movements like circularity, green chemistry, uh, optimization improvements in the mill level, uh, renewable energy in the supply chain, you know, all that needs to happen in order to get a score higher, in order to improve and optimize our supply chain and our products and our materials and thereby, you know, every, every uh, level of the footprint that brands are having. But at the same time, it wasn't the job of the SAC to do that. And so through some conversations with a number of brands uh, and some other investors, the Apparel Impact Institute was launched. Uh, our, our funders or target uh, HSBC from the commercial uh, institutional investment side as well as uh, IDH, the Sustainable Trade Initiative. So we have this interesting public-private kind of partnership and now brands are also putting funding into it. So back to the similar model, our goal is to invest in scaling the top sustainability programs and initiatives that are out there as a collective industry. One voice, one set of you know financial framework, and then we, we aggregate funding and go there. So we're almost like the accelerator of the NGO side mm -hmm. today more than we'd be the accelerator of these innovations. And you're, re you're really lining up a lot of the language. You know, we talk about green chemistry, and you right. talk about aligning it to HIG index. So it's the, the innovations and the entrepreneurs are really Really ready to plug in, right? Absolutely, and I think one of the, if I was to throw up a slide right now, it would be a pyramid, and it would show this sort of foundational work of mill improvement optimization around water and energy, real baseline low-hanging fruit, but if you're not doing this, you're not ready to go into some of the more innovations of cleaner energy, circular systems, uh, you know, some of the systemic solutions, technology that we're talking about. Uh, from an investment standpoint too. What I hope AII will be doing, am I doing on my time? Almost there. What AII will be doing is really helping to establish this framework in partnership with everyone at this table and the brands that we're all talking to. Let's create a framework for where we want to go, how we want to go there, and then we can start to uniquely deploy 
different funding mechanisms, whether it's coming as investment, whether it's coming as philanthropic, or some mix of the two. And meanwhile, being also to create relationships with institutional investors who can stand by and be ready to deploy larger levels of money into these innovations once the, the case studies are proven that you know this is where we want to go. Taking some of that early stage risk, riskier investors that are willing to go or philanthropic and starting to complement that with uh, you know, more stabilized sources of, of funding. And so that's what, that's what our goal is. Amazing. So um, I was fearful of this, that I might not be able to ask all the questions that I wanted to ask. So I'm going to ask one for sure right now and have you all give a uh, somewhat uh, pithy response. Uh, I'm going to start with Isabel. But it's going to be the same question to, to maybe save a little bit of time. And that is, is that what's going to be the, the number one thing that you think is going to help shift the industry um, in and around circular economy, or it could be circular fashion, uh, and, and realizing that, uh, from my standpoint, there is no silver bullet. There's, it's everything. And I think, Carla, you, you hit it. I mean, you talked about, I said you didn't leave anything on the table because you really hit an, an ecosystem. Well, the slide's gone now, but um, you hit an ecosystem that's out there, and we really need to design from the beginning and go to the end and then back around. So um, I'd like to go down the line, and I'd like to know if there's something that comes to mind from each of you um, is, as the number one thing we can do. There is no silver bullet indeed, and actually this industry might be more complex than any other industry. Uh, you need a, an alignment of stars with an alignment of interest with so many actors. The brands are ultimately the one who will push innovations in the supply chain, but they won't do that unless the consumer are willing to take those innovations. So there's a conjunction of factors and a conjunction of effort that needs to be led um, at all fronts, which is making sure the innovations are coming to the market, making sure the consumers are um, aware and are pressing, pressing the brands to be more sustainable, more transparent, um, and also having access to that supply chain. So it's, it's this collaboration, and uh, this is what we've actually tried to all put together, yeah. and there's not one thing, it's actually multiple things that needs to happen together. Okay, and I'm gonna put you all on the spot really too, uh, quickly. Do you have a favorite uh, innovation out of all the batches? We've all seen so many different innovations coming out of the circular. If you could just name one of your favorite, please. Very, that's very difficult. Uh, we have 50 now, so I feel really bad to, to pick one. I'll pick the one that is probably the closer to where we stand now. It's a company um, called Mango Materials. Mm. Uh, unlike Good their names, they have nothing to do with mangoes. Uh, <laughs> they are based in Redwood uh, in, the, in the valley, and they uh, basically extract the methane from wastewater treatment plants and use that methane to feed bacteria that can produce a, a biodegradable uh, uh, plastic that can substitute to polyester. Uh, so essentially, it's closing the loop. Uh, they don't even take pipeline methane. They waste methane, and, and the polyester can be biodegradable in any environment, including marine environment. Um, so they're scaling. It's super capex intensive, so it will uh, probably take a bit of time for them to scale, but we, I do believe this is um, a very promising uh, innovation. Lewis, um, anything that comes to mind as far as what we can do, and then uh, you got to pick a, a favorite innovation. Okay. Yeah. I think you know. I think the, what we can do is is exactly what was just said. Is you know, it, this is an, there's no silver bullet. It's uh, to to sort of pull from the cradle to cradle philosophy. You know, to celebrate diversity. There's going to be a extremely diverse set of solutions, and we're all coming at it from different angles. And I also agree it is while, while brands will implement, you know, there needs to be the economic value. And I think that's what we want to work on is really aligning that this makes sense. Because if we're retooling the whole industrial movement and, and looking at the way that we've established the last 150, 200 years of production into a whole new model, then we've got to demonstrate that it makes economic sense or it's, or it's not going to fly, even if the consumers are saying they find this, uh, you know, to be, to be an interesting uh, solution, you know, it, it's got to make sense. And then from a, there's so many great innovations and solutions that are out there and like all of the ever new and, and uh, Dutch awareness and Warn Again, all doing great things. I'm wearing this shirt. 
my friend Christy Kaler launched a company called For Days, and, uh, and it came with a little bag that when this shirt wears out, I can send it back. And it's so simple, <laughs> but it is a circular system. And yep. I think as we start to see some of the bigger brands get into these ideas of, you know, I have a subscription model, I get three t-shirts. And, you know, as soon as they're done and then they've worn out, which I wear through my t-shirts pretty fast, put them in the bag and they go back and they're being upcycled into fibers. So, you know, I think this is a really interesting way to start looking at different business models. And I just... I want to see more creativity around maybe traditional um, models and how they can start to be uh, played out into, into circular systems like this. Lewis, thank you. Carla, number one thing we can do to shift and your favorite pick, and you can't pick Molly now from, uh, from Mango. Okay, because um, I was going to say that. <laughs> um, yeah, I think it's, that, that's tough, but um, in terms of something we can do, and we, we talk about a lot of how it's a lot of cross collaboration to really affect the entire ecosystem. And I think that's part of our job, but as a fund and a member of the impact investment community, this is a, a rising conversation that I keep having in different, in different panels and different events and talking about sustainable apparel and industrial innovation um, in a new way. And I think right now um, our, our pipeline is growing more than we can handle and there's more money coming into this space, but I think having more of a conversation around this as a way to address issues around sustainability, opportunities to invest to combat climate change. Like it's a very exciting topic that goes much farther than I think um, prior conversations around sustainable apparel. Was that a call for more forward. money in the space? Absolutely. Okay, I yeah. just wanna make sure. Um, I think, yeah, there's a lot of role, there's a lot of opportunity and I think more and more funds that are doing stuff with us, um, similar types of issues, there's a lot of room for us. Um, and then the, if you're thinking of a single innovation, that's so hard, but I think I would go with um, Titan Biosciences. I'm really excited about their technology at the moment, um, and they uh, break down your clothes. So your shirt made out of a cotton and polyester fiber, they can break it down all the way, uh, separate the fibers and get those fibers rebuilt and back into the industry so that the you don't have to be making new polyester and, and that cotton becomes a basically a pulp that can go right back into the viscose industry, which we talked about earlier being a very dirty industry. Now yeah. it can be a clean industry using uh, garment waste. So I think uh, we have a huge waste problem. And so those companies, and there's a number of great ones um, that are addressing that and cultivating and finding value for that waste and getting it back in the supply chain are the most exciting to me. Okay, thank you. And Milos, uh, the shift, one thing we might be able to think about or do, and then your favorite innovation. So as far as the shift, I think that executive engagement between the manufacturing supply chain and brands is, can, can do more. Uh, we've had situations where we were interested in companies and with, you know, we, from one or, or both sectors, we were asked to really bear 100% of risk. And that's not what, you know, we, we can be successful at. And so I think at that point we wanted to raise, the, we will be raising conversations with, on an executive level where we want to, you know, really have the manufacturing and supply chain really start prioritizing some of the circular initiatives more than they do. Because on one side, we want to you know, be buying more and want to create more products. Out of this. And so I really do think that that can really create a little bit of a shift. Sure. Um, as far as innovation, I want to shift more from companies. Not that we don't work with, we work with a lot of them, uh, but I'm really excited about uh, revenues that circular economy can create for a lot of Southeast Asian local economies. If you look at what shared economy then for you know, our world here on, on the Western side, you know, what can similar impact that can create for local economies there. So on one side, you know, Ms. Adidas made the big announcement that they will, make, will not use virgin plastic by 2024. Yeah. So that requires, uh, you know, really stimulating local economies on the collection side, but really creating a new, a lot of new kind of financial instruments for the scaling side, for creation of fiber side. So I think all of that together combined with one brand and more brands really following the same suit will definitely create a, a bit of a more impact where, you know, people have, you know, have a choice now to work in circular economy, which I think is going to be great for everybody. Okay. Uh, all right. So we do have a little bit of time for some questions. Um, and, and so if there are any questions, uh, let me know. Or if we have a, a mic that can go around um, over here, if anyone has any questions. And if you... Do you have a question? Maybe keep it tight as, a, as opposed to a, a statement. And if not, I certainly 
can ask uh, the panelists some other questions. So anybody want to raise their hand? Any questions? Okay, over here. Somebody talked about natural fibers versus fossil fuels, and I think about implications to biodiesel of where we went down that path and what that does for your cotton grower in whatever country versus fossil yeah. fuel seems like a no-brainer. Well, I'd like to have one of the panelists uh, answer that maybe more technically, but I would say natural is always going to be more circular, right, because it's biodegradable, so we're not putting petroleum into it, whether we're processing it and so forth. If we go natural, sometimes we can use, we can actually eliminate dyes completely, water use and all, all of that. Yeah, but, more, I'm, more I'm getting at reusing natural. It yeah. doesn't, it feels like it creates a problem, may not solve a problem versus reusing fossil fuel makes perfect sense. I, I'll, I'll let someone else field it. Well, I mean, these two guys have been working on some of the, or working with some of the investments in the space too, but I think from, a, from the standpoint of collecting, you know, you're collecting the materials, whether it's, whether it's biological or technical nutrient, you know, so whether it's a petroleum based, or, and then a lot of what's, these innovations are really taking a look at even those natural materials like cotton and converting it to a cellulosic based rayon like fabric. And so looking at continuing that life. And I guess from a environmental footprint, you have to weigh that against the water energy and social impact that happened in stage one of growing that material versus the, you know, the costs associated or the energy and water associated with upcycling that rayon. And you guys may have done some studies or looked at some studies around sort of the, the weight of those two. I think that's getting at the question because uh, in, in some ways, you know, the, the technical materials like nylons and poly seem to be a lot easier, but you do have to continue to move in, uh, put virgin content yeah. back into that. And so it's kind of a, yeah, I mean, it's a deeper conversation, but it is kind of weighing out the costs associated with the two. Yeah, no, I think it's also where you have the what's in theory and what's in practice. Uh, one thing is sure is that there is enough polyester uh, out there in the world um, for us to not have to produce polyester anymore if we manage to recycle it. Um, so thanks to some technologies like Titan Bioscience that you, you mentioned, if we manage to scale those technologies, we would be able to be completely independent from fossil fuels uh, in theory, and this will take a bit of time. When it comes to the impact, indeed, uh, if you just look at the impact of growing, which is like basically cradle to gate, uh, Polyester is uh, less is more sustainable in theory than than, than natural fiber. Then you look at um, cradle to, uh, to to grave, um, then then you you have a totally different assessment um, depending yeah. on how you've grown the cotton and the natural fiber. That's so it's a, a bit complex. That's a good answer. Go ahead, please. And just to add, um, you mentioned biofuels and. This company, Mango Materials, that people keep mentioning, what's interesting is a lot of PHA, which is the polymer that they use to make biodegradable plastic, um, will be sugar or corn-based. And so that's a great example of, well, the actual the input to make this biodegradable plastic has a huge environmental footprint. So is it really solving the problem? Um, whereas they're really, we're really excited about waste to feed, like waste as a feedstock. So they're they're able to cultivate methane gas, waste methane, um, to be able to feed the bacteria to be able to create this PHA. So it has a much better environmental impact than a sugar or corn based. So that, that that's always a part of the consideration when looking. And I think that you bring up another area, which is the agricultural waste segment, which we're seeing a lot of that coming in now to circular systems, agro, agro loop, you know, that are companies that are actually looking at, you know, how do we take the byproduct of one industry and mix it into the other. And I'll say one, one last thing, too, is even though the cradle to cradle philosophy sort of advocated for biological systems where it's compostable or biodegradable and technical systems, I feel like so much of that biodegradable, biodegradable material actually should be converted into upcycled material, which is why I get excited about the sort of ever new and folks that are taking that cotton-based material and turning it into a rayon that can then be upcycled into a second life. So uh, Agriloop has been, has been uh, uh, named a couple times here. So the idea there is taking food waste, um, actually smallholder farmer, and being able to take that put it into, if you think, tiny house uh, on, on a plot of land, then actually process it. One side gets biochar, the other one, other side comes out uh, phosphate and, and something that you can uh, give back to, to uh, irrigation or, or farming. And then you're left with cellulose, which you can actually turn into 
possibly a viscose. So it's a huge way to not uh, not turn, you know, cut down trees. And that, that I guess they got the uh, the global uh, awards this last year from uh, put on by H and M. I saw uh, a hand, some hands go up in the back. So if there's a question. Yeah, hi, my name is Manit. Uh, my company is called Lalten. Uh, I run my company in India. So I have around 1,200 artisans uh, in handloom sector, uh, which does work in uh, uh, handlooms, so weaving, as well as block prints. The biggest problem which I face when I interact with my artisans uh, and taking their products to the global market is that they are not aware about low impact dyes or azo free dyes, but their products are amazing. Um, uh, the biggest problem over here is the awareness. So if uh, awareness and then certifications as well. So if we have a basic certifications for many of the artisans, then uh, we can create a lot of sustainable livelihoods for them. Uh, and their products can be taken to global worlds, uh, which doesn't allow right now these products to be taken. Uh, my first question is this. The second question is that we have been working on a lot of uh, eco-friendly products, like products made out of hemp, cane, banana fiber, uh, bamboo fiber. But uh, again, the biggest challenge is uh, taking these products to market. Because we are there in India, we're working with 1,200 artisans, we are giving it to Fab India, we've done some orders with Zara, but the problem is the market. It's very tough to convince them that uh, the products are as certified, as good as are certified uh, to be taken to global markets. So yeah. Yep. Yeah, I, I, f I hear what you're saying, and I think that one of the things we're missing and we've touched on is the commitment side of this, which is, um, I. I our organization is designed to get brands to start committing to actually scaling, whether it's something like a mill improvement alignment initiative or actually sourcing certain material types. And I think that's going to be a big important piece of this too, is to move from the R&D phase or where brands may be investing in you know, the development or the, uh, or the, um, the prototyping of this and moving that into sales, moving that into purchasing the fibers and making commitments around that. Well... I'm getting flagged right now because we're just uh, a couple moments over time, but not by much. Uh, so I guess we'll just take this opportunity to, to thank all the panelists for, for participating. Thank you so much, and good luck on all the innovations. Let's give them a hand. Thank you.